Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Call 0345 6060 973. More on the upcoming budget in a moment with former Housing Secretary and Senior Conservative MP Robert Jenrick. But let's just pick up on the story you've heard on the LBC News Bulletin's first 10 to 8 the time. And the idea MI5 had time to prevent the Manchester Arena bombing, a lawyer for some of the victims' families has claimed. Details now from LBC's Michael Gaffney, who is outside Manchester High Court. Michael. Nick, these bereaved families are making a plea to MI5 to be open and honest in their evidence to this public inquiry into the 2017 terror attack. After hearing over the last two days what they say suggests significant failings by the security services. A senior MI5 official known only as Witness J has been speaking about the service's interactions with suicide bomber Salman Abedi, but under strict restrictions to protect his or her anonymity. Normally these hearings are on the YouTube, live for the whole world to see, but this has been happening in private with only a few key figures, including the inquiry chair, even able to see Jay, who's been screened from general view in the inquiry room. The next round of evidence from that officer will be heard under even tougher restrictions because the content will be so sensitive. And then even the family's lawyers won't be allowed in. That's why they're making this plea for candour based on the information they've heard so far to front up fully to any mistakes that may have been made. They're not suggesting one big failing allowed Abedi to carry out his plot, but rather that many smaller problems accumulated over time. Things like why Abedi wasn't investigated in depth even after MI5 knew he'd been in contact with convicted terrorists, why a file on him was closed in 2014, and why he wasn't stopped and questioned when returning to the UK from overseas. For their part, MI5's witness Jay has said the fragments of information they had on Abadi never amounted to enough to suggest he was planning a bombing. The Home Office say the whole point of MI5's involvement in this inquiry is because they want to learn lessons, so the families can be assured that they will approach those closed hearings happening next week in the right way. Inquiry Chair Sir John Saunders says holding those hearings in private will allow the security services to speak freely and in any case he'll still be the judge of whether any failings occurred. Only one person, Salman Abedi's younger brother Hashim's ever been convicted over the bombing at Manchester Arena but four years on this remains a live investigation. Detectives questioned a man in his 20s in connection with it as recently as last week. Michael Gaffney reporting from his outside Manchester High Court so let's come to the, the big event today in political circles which is of course the budget full coverage uh, and analysis afterwards of course here on LBC but what might we be expecting let's go to senior conservative MP and former housing secretary Robert Jenrick who joins me now and I understand uh, that some of the lines are that today's budget begins the work of preparing for a new economy post-covid an economy of higher wages and higher skills but the stronger economy of the future in what way do you imagine it's going to be stronger Mr Jenrick good morning <clears throat> Hi, good morning, Nick. Morning. Well, I think the international picture remains actually very uncertain, doesn't it, with high levels of inflation, shortages as a result of the global economy opening up. So it, it's a difficult picture uh, for Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, to navigate. But in our own domestic circumstances, we are seeing very good news on the economy growing. It's the fastest growing economy in the G7 unemployment is much lower than many people anticipated. And so that gives some room to the Chancellor, I think, to do two things. Firstly, to invest in public services. And secondly, to ensure that we do continue to tackle the cost of living so that as we move through a difficult period as the economy reopens, we protect people on low and medium income. So I think those two things will be in mind to him whilst he's thinking about what is actually the growth prospects of the economy for the future. And that will be about levelling up, further investment in infrastructure and how we can make the economy more competitive so that we can keep on growing and prospering into the future. Just on one point there, you, you mentioned those who are at the lower end of the scale. Do you think we'll see the government reduce the universal credit taper rate to help those families on lower incomes? Well, I think that's one option that's available to the Chancellor. I don't Just have any inside information. Come on, it seems you to, know. It, see, it seems to me to be a very sensible step because universal credit is designed to make work pay. So if somebody takes on some extra hours, they get to keep 
um, as much of that as possible. And at the moment, you see uh, tax rates that mean that uh, taper rates that mean that you lose as much as 60 percent. And that doesn't seem sensible. So I think that's an attractive option to the chancellor, which targets money at the people who need it the most and helps to incentivise work, which must be at the core of what we as Conservatives believe. But you, you talk about a stronger, or your colleague, I'm sorry, Mr Sunak, will talk about a stronger economy of the future, but it's one that's saddled with more than £2.2 trillion pounds worth of debt. That's not very Thatcherite, is it, Mr Jenrick? No, look, I, I want to hear from the Chancellor, I think many Conservative MPs will want reassurance that there is fiscal responsibility at the heart of his plans, that as the more money becomes available. The OBR forecasts, I think, are going to show that we're in a much better place than they had anticipated. We balance the investment and the public spending in on the public services, for example, with protecting the public finances should there be further shocks in the future. And secondly, that that investment, particularly in the NHS, is accompanied by reform and value for money for the taxpayer because we're putting in very large sums of money the public would by and large support that. But we need to make sure that the NHS is actually reforming, ensuring that you can go and see your GP, that we are embracing modern technology and that we're building the new hospitals that we promised to back at the general election in 2019. You talk about fiscal responsibility. It might be difficult for my listeners to afford any of that to you and your colleagues when we hear that the NH Test and Trace has been an eye-watering waste of taxpayers' money, £37 billion worth of funding, much of it muddled. Why should we trust you lot with any of our cash? Well, I, I've seen some of the reporting around the Public Accounts Committee's uh, investigation into Track and Trace, and I'll, I'll want to read that myself. I wasn't responsible for it, I but I was in cabinet at the time when it was being uh, delivered. It, it did, you're, in you're, fairness... You're talking for, I mean, they've put you out today. I think possibly they've got a bit of a hospital pass here. You've put out, you're put out today to talk about how we're going to hear about fiscal responsibility and the pound in our pocket is safe with the Conservatives. You've just wasted, not you personally, 37 billion quid. It's what's the point? You lot can't add up. You're hopeless. Well, you're fiscally well, just on the You're not fiscally uh, uh, well, responsible. You're fiscally on the specific On the specifics of track and trace, um, this was a programme that delivered, I think, over 300 million tests. 20 million people were contacted. Undoubtedly, it saved people's lives. So it's not correct to say that... Well, if you uh, want to talk whole, figures, at one point, was, 11% of traces were working. 11%. Uh, it, 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 I think there will undoubtedly be lessons to be learnt from how that programme was managed that the report's very clear on that but look at the broader economy i think you can see that the interventions that the chancellor made like the furlough scheme for example were successful they did help to safeguard tens of millions of people's jobs kept people uh, in that connection with their employer and by and large have been able to return to employment that is giving us the bandwidth now to be able to move forward and to look to the future with greater confidence than anyone would have been able to imagine and certainly the OBR, the, the independent forecasting body, had imagined the last time the Chancellor was on his feet. What I think we will want to hear today is that there is a proper plan now to move the economy forward, to grow the economy and to support people with those cost of living challenges which they're going to continue to feel I think for months to come. When my listeners spot you in the house later today, will you be wearing a mask or face covering of some description? Yeah, I am going to, to wear a mask. The, the government's position is clear that it's not a matter of law, it's a question of personal responsibility of, of individual judgment. But the Speaker and the House authorities in Parliament have said that everybody should be wearing masks. They haven't said what MPs should do, but I think it, it would be uh, wrong for MPs to be in a privileged position in the workplace over everybody else, so uh, so I will do. And just lastly, Michael Gove, of course, has assumed your role in housing. He's been in there for over a month, and all he's done is call for a review of the policies that you had green lit. How do you respond to that? Well, look, I wish I wish Michael well, and will await with interest. Well, why is he calling uh, in your policies for review? Do. do you suppose a bit rude, isn't it? Doesn't he rate them? Uh, well, I'm not sure if that is the case. The the, the, he certainly uh, taken a slightly different approach on housing and planning to the one uh, that I took. In what way the, different? Well, we, we don't know exactly, but he said that he's going to take another look at some of the, the policies that we had. 
the the task that I was given by the Prime Minister when I was appointed back in the day was to tackle the housing crisis right. and to help young people and those on low incomes onto the housing ladder by getting more homes built. Right. The country. What does he want? We, dance halls, then? Is, is he after and, more and dance we did halls? that. We, we did that. So uh, I, I certainly hope that Michael Gove doesn't uh, row back on that because that's extremely important to us. You can't talk about the cost of living without talking about the biggest cost to many people, which is the rent, the mortgage, getting on the housing ladder. Grateful for your time today. Thank you. Former Housing Secretary Conservative MP Robert Jenrick appearing here on LBC. We're at eight o'clock. The news is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.